Lal. Such a pleasure having you with us for this new episode of Doing Business in Asia. I know you as the Managing Director of Bruce Clay Australia and India. So you're between two countries, uh, but look, you're, you're off, off, obviously also an award-winning marketer and domain expert in digital marketing very specifically. Since 2009, I know you have been heading Bruce Clay first in India and then more recently also in, in Australia. And that's, that's really something I would love to have us talk about, what your experience there is. Um, yes. And um, really your, your, your insider um, recommendations and insights into how you've built the business there. Uh, what are maybe similarities that you see between different countries? And, and so much more. Shall we dive into this? So um, Bruce Clay is basically a digital marketing company. We specialize in search marketing, which is mm -hmm. uh, basically Google, which is the search engine. So optimizing websites, so popularly known as SEO, search engine optimization, and Google ads um, to you know get your business found online. So uh, we specialize in search marketing, but then we also do all the other parts which a normal digital marketing agency does, such as you know website uh, development and content, all of those pieces that surround surround the digital marketing ecosystem. But our core specialization is uh, SEO and Google Ads. Um, in fact, uh, Bruce uh, set up this company. He's the founder, Bruce Clay. He set up the company back in 1996 uh, in a garage. Um, uh, in his house, basically. Um, so basically, you know, the same startup story that you hear, and he's built it into a really big, successful mm -hmm. company. Um, in fact, if some people type in father of SEO, um, you will find that uh, Bruce is credited as coining the term SEO. Um, and we have written books uh, around this space as well. Um, and uh, I, I came across Bruce when I was in Australia, in fact, um, and I was running a, a very successful telecommunication sales online business and uh, doing really well. And a friend of mine was at that point of time running Bruce Clay in Australia. And uh, we, uh, you know, we mentioned um, how I had always wanted to go back into India uh, since that's my heritage. Um, and I had come into Australia as an international student, uh, you know, back in 1994, ancient times. Um, and um, so we got talking at that point of time and uh, Bruce mentioned, you know, getting into India, setting up an office over there. Um, I struggled with that for a little bit, you know, in my mind because I was running a decently successful uh, company here in Australia. Uh -huh. Um, but, you know, the lure was too good. The opportunity that presented itself in the form of India uh, with its hundreds of millions of consumers um, and, and my heritage, I said, okay, you know, they say uh, YOLO, you only live once um, and you, you must, you know, try things out rather than going, you know, in your old age, you think, oh, I could have done that. I, I might have done this. I said, we can't keep playing it safe. So I had to convince my wife and I had just had a newborn baby at that point of time. And we just packed our bags and uh, moved into India. So, um, and that's when we set up Bruce Clay over there. So um, yeah, it's been, it's been a nice journey. So you've successfully navigated unique challenges presented by the complexity of the Indian business environment. We already talked a little bit offline about that and it would be wonderful to actually know more about it. Um, setting up a business in a digital marketing agency in India in itself is such an experience. So what did that actually mean for you? What was your experience there? What, what did you find in India, uh, India maybe? Um, what has cha had changed since you had left India before you started to study in Australia? Oh, India has changed massively. There's no question about that. The India I left in 94 uh, was very different at that point of time. Uh, you know, you, uh, even the internet had really not launched worldwide. So, uh, you know, and uh, India had just started opening up its business environment. I think it was around 92. Um, so the Indian environment I left was very different. 
But when I relocated to India um, in, it was the end of 2009, so you can say about 2010, um, I was lured obviously with the massive potential. I saw, you know, okay, at that time, India had 50 million internet users. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know, uh, compared to Australia, where we have got, you know, at that point of time, uh, you know, population of 20 million, probably 15 million with internet uh, access. Um, so I thought, you know, let's let's go into this market and try it out. So I uh, set up uh, the digital agency, Bruce Clay, uh, the digital marketing agency in India. And, uh, you know, I was really gung-ho about it. And we knew when we entered the market that we were entering a very competitive uh, Indian business environment because uh, a lot of these international digital marketing agencies have their offices set up in India because they use it as a back office and they uh, service international markets from there. Yeah. So most of the digital marketing agencies in India were set up with that perspective versus what we were doing was the reverse. So we were coming in with the idea that, hey, we are going to bring in our knowledge, our resources, our tools, and we are going to target the Indian market and build up the business in India, targeting Indian companies. Um, however, what I didn't take into account was at that point of time, it was way too early for SEO. Most companies um, in India at that time didn't even spend 5% of their marketing budget on the entire digital spectrum, which includes, you know, website design, SEO, Google ads, everything. Um, so, you know, when we first set up and we tried to start selling the SEO services, we ran into a lot of uh, backdraft on that. So um, for the first couple of years, we then had to change and we had to do a lot of investment in education. Uh, we started flying Bruce Clay from US into India and we started doing uh, SEO training webinars, uh, not webinars, sorry, webinars comes because nowadays we use webinars so much. We started doing proper SEO training events face to face and we would attract marketers from all across India um, to come and take the training, etc. cetera. Um, and then for us, the first turning point was 2011 when Google uh, started uh, tightening up its optimization um, um, algorithm and loads and loads of websites, like literally tens and hundreds of thousands of websites got penalized, they lost rankings, etc. And that's when, um, you know, businesses started to understand in India that, um, you know, SEO is something that requires professional knowledge, expertise and help. Um, and um, that, that was our first turning point. Um, and then uh, the next big turning point for us came in 2016, when uh, Reliance Geo, which is uh, one of the top um, telcos now, um, they launched uh, telecommunication and internet services. And they came up with, they set up the 4G network, I think from memory, and uh, they invested, um, you know, billions of dollars into the setting up this uh, network. And uh, uh, they gave internet services away for free to the masses to begin to attract them. So overnight, India suddenly got a hundred million new internet users uh, within, within months. Um, and today, uh, if we fast forward to 2020, uh, 2021, uh, we are talking 550 million plus internet users. So, you know, the market has massively changed. Things are booming uh, for us. In India, we work with clients uh, such, uh, right at the top of the business spectrum, such as Hindustan Times, Bata, Jabong, uh, Groupon, uh, Oppo, stuff like that. So, so it's really changed and it's really uh, become much, much better. Mm. And I, I would assume that infrastructures are really important for you in that business. What did you find in India? Oh, yeah. Uh, talking about infrastructure, um, I think as an international company who might want to look at investing in India, um, it, this is a very, very important because every company will need an office, right? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, office space can come in many forms um, in India. Um, and and it's, it can be really cheap as well. So you can get something very, very cheap, um, but that's in a more like a residential suburb, et cetera. 
And I would say uh, as an international company, you want to avoid doing something like that because it has a lot of challenges. Um, you might not have 24 hour power supply or internet services, um, you know, stuff like that. There, there, there can be challenges. So what you're much safer doing is to establish a presence in a proper business park. So in India, we have got a lot of these business parks which are there where loads and loads of corporates are all uh, squeezed into um, you know that that business park area, and those. And are at that moment in time, you're actually in Delhi when you were arriving, right? Yes, I I actually chose uh, Delhi uh, as a city uh, purely because of my family background and having grown up uh, in that city. Uh, in fact, talking about cities, um, if we talk, um, you know, if as an international company you want to set up, uh, the few major cities are New Delhi, Gurgaon. Um, then you've got uh, Mumbai, uh, which is more of a financial hub. Mm -hmm. um, you've got, uh, and, and in South India, you've got three big ones, which are Chennai, Bangalore, and Hyderabad. Uh, these would be good ones. Bangalore is really known for its uh, IT side of things. It's the Silicon Valley of India. Um, and the other thing to keep in mind over there would be Delhi, Gurgaon, Mumbai would be on the higher side, more expensive, versus uh, the South Indian cities, you could straight away get about a 30% cost saving, um, whereas you'll still get a similar level, level of infrastructure as well as uh, human resources as well. So um, just uh, switching back a little back to talk about that infrastructure that we were talking about. Um, so now what you'll find is that, um, so, so if, if someone went into say, a non-traditional office space, you'll have those challenges, which you don't want, right? Because you want to focus your business in building your business rather than getting sidetracked into, oh, the internet's not working today or telecommunications is an issue, et cetera. But now, fast forward to 2021, a few years ago, we were blessed with having co-working spaces come into India as well. So WeWork, which is a very, very big international brand of co-working spaces, and we have that locally in Australia as well, overseas, um, they entered the Indian market as well. And I would say, um, hands down, if you're an international business planning to set up in India, first thing you do, just go into a co-working space. That way you don't have any worries of even, you know, any of the long-term leases or anything. Just go into co-working spaces. They are generally on a, you know, month to month or a six month contract, right? They provide you the telecommunications, the internet, um, everything. All, and and in, India, in India, one other thing that a lot of people forget is if we talk about human resources, Unlike in the Australian culture where, you know, you will make your own coffee and tea and you'll just go and warm up your own food and stuff. In India, they have this um, culture where you have someone uh, who is uh, classified as an office boy or a peon and they provide those support services, right? So they, you know, you want water, they'll just say, hey, get me some water and some water comes to you or they'll make your tea, coffee, warm up your lunch and do all of that. So none of those things you need to think about when you go into the co-working space because you know all of this support services is provided for so i would say yeah it is more expensive but it's the best thing to do go with the co-working space into the infrastructure thing so what kind of mindset would you recommend people to adopt when they go into India, work across India, because India in itself has such a diversity as where well. you've mentioned different locations and each one of them, of course, is slightly different. We have that in other countries as well, but it's very pronounced, I think, in India. And right. so how do you how do you manage to be local somewhat for the clients? Yeah, oh, that's actually a very interesting point. So one of the things I noticed is, um, so our main office uh, is in Delhi, Gurgaon, uh, which, which is where we are. Um, and when uh, we would uh, talk to clients in other cities, we noticed that pretty much all of them ask, are you local to us? Because they pretty much expect that, you know, they'll pick up the phone or they'll want a meeting and you can just come into their office and talk to them and all of that. So that, that certainly has been a challenge where I found that uh, you know, businesses want you to be local to them because they, they expect 
um, that you can just come into their office and have a chat. Um, but but even talking about that local function, what I noticed was, you know, like we were in Delhi and Delhi is a really big uh, city. Um, so sometimes uh, and uh, traveling within it due to traffic, etc., can take a lot of time. Um, and a lot of clients will want to do a meeting, uh, which I strongly believe can anyhow be done over the phone or the internet uh, with web meetings. But because the culture, especially, you know, many years ago, wasn't a, as much there uh, of having a web meeting. Um, so, you know, you go in for these small meetings and it could consume half your day. So if you can, you would want to try to, you know, have more of the web meetings and try to see if there's a structure where you can come up with. Uh, but I suspect with uh, COVID coming in, the mindsets have really changed. Um, and so uh, it's uh, really helped uh, transform businesses. You do feel that there's that, there remains that tendency to prefer face-to-face. -face. That, that's been something that you've seen mainly? Yes, yes, yeah. absolutely. They, they prefer that face-to-face -face meeting, um, you know, where you can have mm -hmm. a cup of tea um, or if it's after hours, maybe a drink and, you know, so it's a uh, conversational talk. part and contextual part of the business meetings as well. Absolutely, absolutely, that's what it is. So how do you how do you replace that when you talk to your teams in India? Is there and you're doing that virtually at the moment? Do you have particular oh, techniques? Oh yes, absolutely. So um, luck, luckily for me. Um, I was anyhow always into technology, et cetera. So I was a very early adopter of a lot of technology. So um, like, you know, uh, web meetings, uh, I started promoting them within the business, you know, probably six years ago, uh, five years ago, where I would try to, because we, ha we have clients all across India. Um, so we've got clients in Mumbai and Bangalore, et cetera, et cetera. And we use the web meetings as an interface um, rather than sending some people, account managers to each city to try to, you know, service the client. So we were early adopters for it. Um, but in terms of how, for example, COVID came, uh, has come in, um, and, or even if I take a step back, I actually moved uh, to Australia, back into Australia a few years ago. Um, so keeping that in mind, I, I further adopted technology into the workspace. So we started using, uh, in, in our case, we used a software called GoToMeeting, but there are lots of them, like we're doing this particular one on a Zoom call. So, and Zoom, I think might have even become a verb uh, in, the, in the industry now. So you've got Zoom, you've got Microsoft Teams, uh, Google Meet. Um, there are so many options that are available and they're world-class options. And I think if you, if you use them, they massively help you with, uh, with your business transformation, right? Um, you can, uh, like, there are staff members in my organization that I've never met face, face to face, but I know them so well because we are just having these video calls all the time. You just ask someone to uh, get on a video call and instantly it's like, it's like your office cooler environment that you used to have back then, um, the, that uh, water cooler environment. And, it's 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 uh, replaced with the zoom calls so you just get on quick calls short five minute ones where required or longer structured meetings um and that that's how i think uh, using um you know virtual tools really helps massively it's a different way of having that conversation around the coffee machine or your cup of tea isn't it absolutely oh and you can still uh, ask everyone to hey grab your cup of tea bring it on let's do a virtual cheers and get get business going <laughs> excellent um so coming back to australia how did you feel about what what kind of similarities and differences did you see from that experience because there we are in a situation where you were born and brought up in india you did came come to university in australia established yourself here then expatriated to your original home country, then came back to Australia. What, what happened there? What did you see? What did you, what, what was your mindset? Hmm. Complex, very complex question. Um, so Australia, obviously what attracted us back into Australia was the fact that, um, you know, Australia is uh, really easy to do business 
uh, in. Um, and it's a, at the end of the day, it's also a market that is growing. Um, but in terms of if I had to make uh, talk about similarities, etc., cetera, um, I think Australia is a lot faster in adopting uh, technologies, et cetera. Um, so if, if I brought it very uh, niche to say uh, SEO, which is what we you know specialize in, um, in Australia, SEO is uh, taken as a part of the marketing mix um, at a significantly higher level um, than um, in a place like India, where SEO is still, um, um, from a marketing mix perspective, um, still finding its feet, right? Whereas um, in, in Australia, it's a par hardcore part, part of the plan. Um, in Australia, um, also because of uh, better infrastructure, etc., in place, um, uh, incorporating the web meetings, etc., um, is a lot more simpler. Um, and I think uh, with with this COVID pandemic now, uh, people have now become so used to uh, Zoom meetings that uh, I don't think uh, people are willing to go back uh, into the normal workday culture of going into the office. Um, and I think uh, that way in India also, people have, uh, are transforming. Like I see all our own employees um, in the Indian office. Um, and I've recently took a survey of, you know, how many of them want to come back into the office. And uh, pretty much all of them have said that, uh, you know, we prefer working from home. It saves us time uh, to go into the office. Um, you, have you, you get to spend more family time, uh, all, all those things. So do you think that the way in which COVID has pushed that agenda of being virtually connected, has that made companies going international harder or easier or maybe just different? I think easier. I, I, I really think, so while COVID has had, you know, both challenges and it has also brought a lot of opportunity, right? Um, if I take our own Bruce Clay India office as an example, um, what, what COVID has done was initially it was a massive challenge for us. Um, you know, we lost a lot of business due to the, comple the complex environment that it created, right? Um, and the business uncertainty and economy went down, etc. But it also meant that it forced us to really put, put on our thinking caps and explore how we can, you know, uh, really survive this um, COVID pandemic. And previously, we would have never thought that you can get rid of office infrastructure, right? But today, um, we have been able to remove office infrastructure, like sure, you keep a small uh, office space available so that some people you can, uh, you know, get into the office when required, but mostly you can get rid of that. And that's a massive cost saving for businesses. So, um, and that's what we have done um, in, the, in our, uh, in our uh, own of office, we've got rid of the office space. Um, and that means that you also have good cost savings come into play, right? And then you can use that money to, you know, do team bonding activities, uh, employee recognition, stuff like that to help help with that whole uh, employees side of things and use that money to build the business up. Mm -hmm. So I certainly think that uh, it has created a lot of opportunities as well. It's forced uh, business owners to think uh, it's massively helped with uh, the online adoption as well, because a lot of businesses that were traditional and they were very happy in that space because they're doing well. Right. But suddenly when they have to think of, Oh, I don't suddenly have this business model anymore. What do I do? So they were forced into adopting an online business model. Um, even if you think of traditional uh, restaurants type of businesses, right? They might not have had an e-commerce interface and online ordering, et cetera, but now they're all doing that. So it's really uh, helped us uh, leapfrog and accelerate that growth into business transformation. So when you do business in India, and now of course you're a serial entrepreneur and you've Seen, seen a lot of different scenarios. What is it that you have to keep in mind that has to do with people and culture and performance, maybe incentives as well, and just that, you know, not only business context, but the people within it? Absolutely. It's a really great question. 
uh, because people and culture are central to any business, right? If you want to survive, if you want to grow, um, the only way you can do that is if you have an exceptional team behind you because yeah, any entrepreneur on their own will never be successful unless they have a fantastic team behind them. Um, and I, I'm really blessed that I've got, I've over the years, I've been able to uh, put together a really good team. Um, so if we talked about, let's say, um, the environment in India as an example, because we are doing this segment on doing business in Asia, um, human resources, so for any company that's planning to set up uh, a business over there, uh, obviously human resources are significantly cheaper than a, a Western country. Um, and I'm talking a cost differential of about 3x, you know, um, maybe more uh, if, if you're going into a, a smaller city in India, but at least if you compare it to a major city, um, you're talking about a 3x uh, differential, so you can get them much cheaper. Uh, but finding high quality resources, that's more of a challenge. So you want to make sure you vet them really well. Um, but when, uh, and one way of uh, getting those smarter candidates is sometimes you might want to find some fresh graduates who have got all the skills uh, in terms of the background knowledge, et cetera, and train them up. So you invest in their training, but they Edge come with up universities with... early and take exactly. them from there. Uh, because people in India by default speak good English, et cetera, anyhow, right? Uh, but when you find candidates who are from a good educational background, I can tell you this, they are on par with any uh, of the best of the best candidates in any Western country, right? Um, because India has a fantastic educational system. Um, the other thing you might want to also talk about when we talk, uh, think about uh, human resources in India is employees tend to change jobs frequently, unlike, uh, uh, say, mm -hmm. the Australian culture where employees will be there for many, many years in the same company. So uh, you, you will want to do things to help with your staff retention. Um, so you'll want to think of both monetary and non-monetary rewards. Um, so non-monetary re rewards uh, could be in the sense of employee recognition, you know, praising them in front of uh, other staff uh, and the monetary recognition. Oh, that's a good one. Um, what we can do is in, in India, uh, especially North India, Diwali is uh, one of the most significant festivals. It is the, uh, it is the equivalent of Christmas, right? So um, one of the things uh, I would say is during Diwali, if, if your business has had a good year, then that's the right time to give some kind of a monetary incentive to your staff. So, um, and, and then obviously apart from that, you know, do some team building activities, uh, team bonding activities, all those kind of things, or what, whatever you would have done normally here uh, in Australia as well. And so moving from people and culture towards more the regulatory environment, what can you share with us about that? Ooh, that's, that's another good one. Yeah. It actually touches a raw nerve for me because uh, regulatory environment. So, you know, if you think of setting up and I've set up businesses in Australia and they're really easy to set up, you know, it's fairly easy to walk into, um, you know, I think, New South Wales Chamber of Commerce or something, um, you know, get get yourself an ABN number and you're pretty much in business. Um, it is not that easy in India. Um, you really, there is a lot of red tape associated uh, around setting up the business. Um, I remember when we had to uh, just set up Bruce Clay India, um, you know, you have to set up, why is it Bruce Clay? How, what is your relationship? There's a lot of uh, stuff that needed to, a lot of paperwork that needed to be done. Um, and that's where having uh, a great team of people who can consult and help you navigate the complex Indian business environment is extremely important. I was very fortunate to use my family connections to, um, you know, hire the right resources. So I was able to get uh, a really good uh, CA firm, a chartered accounting firm, um, and get some good law, uh, a good law firm, etc., in place. So I would say uh, any international business that wants wants to set up should invest in in a good uh, CA and law firm to help you set up the business in the right way. Um, even things like you know when your investment from overseas comes into India, 
there are so many challenges even associated around that you know what route has it taken where is the money source from um, kyc which is a term i was not so familiar with or uh, when i was in australia um, that's no know your customer uh, all those kind of things have come into play um, if i want to repatriate funds from india like unlike australia it's so easy for me to just send send money but uh, from india you have to fill in the paperwork etc so it is a complex business environment from that that perspective so what's your general advice around doing business in india the opportunities you've mentioned some challenges um, if you put that you know in a nutshell a recommendation to the future business All leader the, in or you know across asia but really with that focus on india look um obviously while there are challenges the indian environment poses but there are also tremendous opportunities right um india has got those hundreds of millions of consumers um in the middle class so let's not talk about the billion people because you'll you, you know most of them are under the poverty line but even without that the indian middle class is massive so um there there is so much potential from that perspective um also indians are very resilient as a population so you you and they bring up a lot of creativity they like i said the human resources are fantastic you know um they can be loyal they uh, they can be creative they are very smart so um and and you can some businesses can use india as a back office to you know do a lot of work that they and i know lots of businesses that use it for accounting for digital marketing for so many of these knowledge process outsourcing medical transcription there's so much stuff that goes on even law firms so everyone is using countries like uh, india even philippines for that matter uh, where they have got a good english speaking population so um india i would say yes you you must look at it as, as an opportunity um just keep in mind these things that we just covered uh, you know uh, during our earlier part of the conversation that you know where should you set up your office make sure your infrastructure is correctly set up make sure you have the right consultants in place to guide you with the right uh, uh, legality of stuff um but otherwise it's it's such a massive mo- market to really tap into i uh, you know it's lovely so when you do business in india do you think that that sets you up really well to do business in other parts of asia and if so which ones oh yeah um look uh, if you're doing business in india from there if you thought of it like you mentioned a gateway um dubai uh, is another market middle east uh which a lot of uh, there's a lot of activity between uh, uh india and dubai so Mid- middle east is a really good way to look into it singapore uh, is another uh, opportunity that you know a lot of people from india businesses get into singapore etc some of them might do it uh, even for tax purposes because i believe singapore if i'm right has a 10% uh, uh tax structure etc in place um then within within the local indian subcontinent um you could get into places like sri lanka nepal uh, you know pakistan uh but i i think uh those are still economies that are still growing in in the in their infancy um so they would have i my thought would be they would have even a higher complexity involved that's great thank you Well, thank you so much, Sidlal, Managing Director of Bruce Clay Australia and India and Serial Entrepreneur. Thank you so much for giving us those insights into your perspectives on India. Thank you so much.